Good evening again, and thank you for joining PCRT Online with our 50th theme, Here We Stand. It's my prayer that you've been encouraged and edified by what you've heard here from the comfort of your home. The Alliance's goal through our events is to provide sound doctrine, boldly preach. Our annual event sponsor, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, would echo that same outcome, and we thank them for their generous support of Alliance events. Tonight, we'll hear from Kevin DeYoung, not once, but twice. First, on Grace So Rich and Free, and then the Reformation's chief end. I am sure we'll be blessed. Once again, this is a special weekend, as we've been offered wonderful kindness for just a few more hours. Your gift tonight will be matched, dollar for dollar, up to $15,000. So please go visit AllianceLive.org. That's AllianceLive.org to donate right now. And a gift of $35 or more will be thanked with the audio from this year's PCRT. Thank you for joining us this year. Thank you for watching. And thank you for your prayers. We come tonight to Sola Grazia. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 verses 19 through 26. The book of Genesis, you probably know, has 50 chapters. The chapters and the verses, of course, were added centuries later and not inspired, though helpful. What is inspired are 10 sections throughout the book of Genesis, which are demarcated by the Hebrew word toledot, translated probably in your Bible as generation or descendants. Ten times we read, these are the generations of, or these are the descendants of. There are ten of these Toledot sections. First, we have the prologue, the creation of the heavens and the earth, and then the Toledot, the descendants, the generations of the heaven and earth, chapter 2, 4, 5, 1, Adam, 6, 9, Noah, 10, 1, the sons of Noah, 11, 10, Shem, 11, 27, Terah, Chapter 25, verse 12, Ishmael, 25, 19, Isaac, 36, 1 and 9, Esau, and then taking up the last chunk of the book in chapter 37 and following, Jacob. Five of these Toledot sections are followed by narratives, and five are followed by genealogies. They are not many biographies. In fact, they can be a little misleading if you think that the generation of Isaac, for example, is about Isaac. Oftentimes, the Toledot is about the descendants that came from the named person or patriarch. In each of them, the author is trying to make a theological point, addressing an overall theological theme with each of the ten generations. Think of it as a long rope stretching from the very beginning of history through these 50 chapters. And this long rope has tied 10 knots. Or, another analogy, if you think of plane flying at 30,000 feet over the span of human history in these opening chapters, and then dropping down these 10 times to understand what's happening in these families, as the camera then zooms in on God's redemptive line. These knots along the way, some of them are off of the main rope. Esau, Ishmael, for example, are not part of the chosen line. But overall, we see God's redemptive plan carried out with these families. And so here we have one of these Toledot sections, follow along, beginning in verse 19. These are the generations, the Toledot, of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? 
So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. The story here is familiar to most of us. It's been told many times. Rebecca has two sons jostling within her. The first comes out red, ruddy, exceptionally hairy. The word in Hebrew for hairy, seir, sounds like seir, which is where the descendants of Esau will live. The word red, Adom, sounds like Edom, which is going to be another name for Esau. So he is a hairy Edom of an Esau man. And then the second son comes out holding the heel of Esau. His name, Yaakob, means he grasps the heel. Kind of euphemism for being a trickster, deceitful. From the womb, these two were struggling. From birth, the younger was in a position to supplant the older. From the very moment that they entered, exited the birth canal, the younger was trying to supplant the older. That's the story. It's told in just a minute or two in these verses. So beyond and behind these details, what is this story about? It's really quite simple. This is an origin story. It answers the question for the Israelites and by extension for us as God's people, how did we get here? Put yourself in the mindset of an Israelite reading this, hearing this story, perhaps read by a teaching priest some centuries later or passed on around the dinner table from mother, father, grandparents, this story would remind you where you came from and how you got here. After all, Jacob is going to be renamed Israel, and from Jacob or Israel will come this great nation. It's an origin story. Now think about it. All the popular epic stories, think of the movies of our day, they all have origin stories. Star Wars. Where did Luke come from? Well, sorry to spoil it, Darth Vader was his father. If you haven't seen it, well, that's your problem. Where did the emperor come from? Now, Disney Plus is just spinning out more and more series. They're all origin stories. You want to know where Boba Fett came from? You want to know where Anakin came from? You want to know where minor bit characters? Uh, where I want, I want a, where, a whole series about the hammerhead guy, the guy who says, it's a trap, Admiral Akbar. I want a whole series. I want all of the origin stories. Harry Potter, he discovers he's a wizard. Eventually, he learns his parents were murdered by Lord Voldemort, but Harry survived. He has a lightning-shaped scar on his head. Superman, born on Krypton, parents launched, launched him to Earth moments before the planet was destroyed. Batman, very angsty, witnessed the death of his parents, became obsessed with justice. The whole Marvel Cinematic Universe is too complicated for me to follow. I've hardly seen any of the movies, but they all have some origin story, and somehow it's, I guess, all connected. The Disney movies, one of the most dangerous persons you can be in a Disney movie is a parent because so many of them die. Elsa and Anna, parents gone. Tarzan, parents gone. Simba, sorry. Bambi, Rapunzel, Quasimodo, over and over. <laughs> the origin story, Disney, how do we do this? Parents gone. Every country has an origin story. Who they are, how they came into being. That's in part what's been so controversial in America over the past number of years and really for a long time. People arguing, what is the story of America? If our national story used to be told as heroism and liberty and triumph, now many tell it as 
nothing but the opposite, evil, cruelty, hypocrisy. And the debates get heated because it has to do with, well, who are we? How did we get here? Your family has an origin story. You've prob probably recounted some of the details before. The de Youngs trace their history as far as we can. I had a great, great uncle. He gave me his genealogy stuff, and he was able to trace back our de Young lineage all the way to Dortrecht, Netherlands, at the end of the 17th century. A couple generations removed from the Synod of Dort. I'd like to think I had a relative there, but I don't want to look because I don't want him to be on the wrong side. <laughs> but the de Youngs come from Dortrecht. They came to America in the 19th century, settled first in southwest Minnesota. The story is told, though I can't find confirmation for it, that one of my ancestors fought for the Union in the Civil War, and that's where the name was changed from de Young with a J to de Young with a Y, whoever Union quartermaster writing it down, de Young, Y, and we don't do J's anymore. My dad grew up on a farm downstate from Chicago. All of the other men in the family are Cubs fans, but he grew up liking the White Sox because they won the pennant in 1959 when he was 10 years old, and so he switched to them, and now that's passed on to me. And we're Bears fans, and now my sons who have never lived in Chicago and we're living in Charlotte, we're watching the Bears. This is the most exciting it's ever been for a Bears fan. Right now, we are going to crush the offseason. We got the draft picks. We got the, the cap space. Worst record. My sons are asking me, Dad, explain again. Why am I rooting for the Chicago Bears? You've never even lived there. As far, as, when I've been with you, what's the connection? So I explain, oh, I was born there and my dad was from there. Moved to Michigan in 1985. To Hope College, went to seminary in Boston, met Trisha there, went to Orange City, Iowa for two years, came to East Lansing for 13 years. Now we live in North Carolina. You have your own story. It says something about who you are. It explains something, uh, maybe the, the teams you root for, but maybe more important things, how you got here, where you came from, good or bad, and we're all a mixture of both. That origin, that family history, it's something I hope you know a little bit about and you repeat, it helps to explain who you are. This short section in Genesis 25 is the origin story for God's people. Now you, of course, trace them back to Abraham and you can take the genealogy as Luke's gospel does all the way back to Adam to the very beginning. And that is the beginning in one sense. Certainly, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. But this is the birth of Jacob. He will be called Israel, and from his lineage will be the 12 tribes, the namesake for the nation and the people as they understood themselves. They were all sons somewhere of Jacob. And so you have to imagine yourself as an Israelite, perhaps leaving Egypt and on the way, retelling the story to each other. Or sometime, perhaps, wandering in the wilderness. As Moses writes it down. You relay to each other the story. Or maybe it's centuries later, under David's rule, and you hear the story. Or in captivity, in Babylon, there with the exiles, wondering if God's promises have failed. And you recount the story again. Remember, son. Remember, daughter. Who we are. How we got here. Where we came from. And we should read this as our story. Most of us, I imagine, are not Jewish by ethnicity. But we claim this as God's people through Christ. Our story descended spiritually from Abraham, children of the promise, the new covenant Israel of God, a wild branch grafted in to the olive tree. This is our story. So if you're a Christian here, if you're not a Christian here, Hope you will listen to this, that you might make this your story. If you are a Christian, you are to think about how Jacob came into the world. How did Jacob come into the world? And the answer is staring us right in the face. Jacob came into the world in his position by grace. 
grace upon grace, all grace, and grace alone. And we're going to see this in two ways. And once you see this, if you haven't seen it before, you will not be able to unsee it. And whenever you come to this text, you will think this is our origin story as God's people. Two things, two things to see. We see about Jacob's history and our history. God made us, God chose us. First, notice God made us and God made Jacob. Now you say, well, that's a little bit lame. That's true of everyone, of course. God's a creator. But here the point is underlined in a specific way. You look at verse 21, like Sarah and so many of the matriarchs and heroines in the Bible, Rebekah was barren. And notice, Isaac and Rebekah do not resort to another woman. Isaac is the only patriarch to be truly monogamous. Remember, Abraham of Sarah's idea and takes a maidservant, and Jacob gets tricked, but he has two wives and also maidservants. But no, Isaac, Rebekah, it's just the two of them. There's, there's, there's no other women entering the picture. So this is going to take a miracle. Rebekah, verse 26, was barren. And you read, or verse 27, or 21, and right before that you read, Isaac prayed. That's not a sermon so much about prayer, but just let that be a parenthesis. Even when we have all the medical advances we have, whatever it might be, is our first reaction as God's people to pray. Here's a problem. And Isaac prayed, and the Lord granted his prayer. And she conceived. Of course, in one sense, every new life is from God. He's the maker of us all. But this is a special point not to be forgotten. In a way, you could say God made these twins ex nihilo, out of nothing. By underlining that Rebecca was barren, it's saying that the, the raw material, as they understood it in a primitive sense, and they didn't have all the science to know, is it Isaac, is it Rebecca, what's going on here? But they just identified that if they can't have children, they say, well, the woman is barren. The raw material, physiological, biological raw material is not there for Isaac and Rebecca to have children. That's underscored so that we realize this is not the natural outworking of ordinary biological function. Some people sort of look at each other and smile, and there's a baby. Not so here for Isaac and Rebecca. The point is that this was not a natural birth. It was a supernatural birth. Now, one response to this is simply to give thanks for life. They were all meant to remember. We shouldn't be here. According to the laws of nature, this was not supposed to happen. Life is a gift, and that's true for each of us, and we should give thanks. But even more profoundly, they were to remember as God's people. They came into being because God willed them to come into being. It was not simply the natural process. There was no natural process to work with Isaac and Rebekah to bear a child. They were to remember in their origin story, we owe our very existence to the mercy and the power of God. And that's true on a biological level in one sense for any of us. Life is, is a gift. And yet, we're meant to draw a deeper spiritual realization. Here's how it's put in the Gospel of John. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you're a Christian, you're a miracle. Even if you grew up in a Christian home, a boring, wonderful testimony, never know a day when you didn't know Jesus, if you are truly born again, that has come not from your parents. It has come from God, and it's a miracle. If you have a church trust you come from a church, some of you here, around town, elsewhere around the state, the region, your church is a miracle. It sounds prosaic, but if you really believe 
in Jesus Christ. It's a miracle. You're here. You have life. And you've been given this life by God's sovereign willing. That's what the people were to remember there as they left Egypt, as they recollected among the exiles in Babylon. Mom, Dad, how did we get here? Well, honey, you take it. I don't want to do the birds and the bees. No, no, no. I'm not asking that. I'm saying as a people. Oh, remember? Remember Jacob? Remember his mom and dad? They couldn't have any kids. The only way is because Isaac prayed and God heard the prayer, gave them a miracle. Remember the warnings, Deuteronomy chapter 8? Moses said, you're going to get to the promised land, some of you. In, in years from now, you're going to be enjoying a harvest and you're going to be having a great time with your kids and grandkids and having a vine and a fig tree and and you're going to be tempted to think that you did it. We did it. We got here. We defeated the Canaanites. We plowed. We labored. We sowed. We reaped. We were smart. We did it. And Moses said, don't forget, you weren't impressive. Don't forget, you didn't deserve it. Don't forget how you inherited the land. And how much more, not just the land, because there they did have to fight as the Lord fought through them, but their very existence, their very birth was because of a miracle. Now, how does that change how you should view your life and your church? God made you. It ought to give you an awareness of just how amazing God is and how grateful we ought to be. One of my children, I won't say which one, but she is a wonderful daughter. And uh, as sometimes happens with children, you go through phases, we hope, a phase of expecting a lot of things to fall into place or things to be purchased or lots of things to be given. And one time last year or so, my wife and I said to this wonderful child, you're acting a bit entitled then later, when the same sort of behavior was happening, and we were going into the same dad speech, and she said, I know, I know. You already told me I'm enlightened. I said, no, 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 no. You, that is not the word we said. Different word. Would that you were enlightened to the grace given you daily by your parents. So now... When we come to the speech, she will sometimes say, I know I'm being enlightened again. Many of us ought to be enlightened to the grace that God has given to us, but instead, we are entitled. Like, I, I deserve it, earned it, I should get it. This whole story of where they came from was to remind them of the miracle that was their very existence. If Rebecca's womb was as good as dead, then their lives were worse than dead. They had no business to be there at all. Their mom, grandma, great, 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 great grandma had no way to conceive children, and the whole nation of them should not have been there, but here they were. And no matter where you come from, how long you've been a Christian, there is no earthly reason why you and I should be praising God. Christ. But here we are by a miracle, a sovereign, unilateral miracle of God's grace. That's our origin story. He made us. And second, He chose us. The story of the gestation in the womb and the birth explains the lifelong tensions between Esau and Jacob and the centuries-long conflict that would unfold between the Edomites and the Israelites. We read in verse 22, the children were struggling within her. So notice parentheses. In the womb, they are called children. They don't become children. Whether they are chosen to be birthed or not, they are from the moment of conception, not a mere clump of cells, not yet to be born children. They are children, and they're struggling. 
It's a strong verb. It translated, they were crushing each other, as siblings do. Rebecca felt the violent collision within her hands and feet sticking out. She asked why, and it was a precursor of things to come. We read Genesis in many ways. Genesis is a story of the blessing. It's a story of promise. It's a story of providence. All of that is, is true. You can also read it as a story of one massively dysfunctional family. You can read Genesis as constant fraternal bickering. Cain and Abel, the sons of Noah, Abraham and Lot, his relative, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his older brothers. From the very beginning, the story of Genesis is about brothers fighting. Take heart, parents. And in verse 23, we read that God is going to overturn the normal practice. There are two nations in your womb, two peoples. And contrary to the norm, the one shall be stronger than the other, and the older, in fact, shall serve the younger. We see these surprising reversals all the time in Genesis. The offering of Cain was rejected while Abel's was accepted. The youngest brother, Seth, would become the chosen line. Isaac instead of Ishmael. Rachel instead of her older sister, Leah. Joseph and Judah instead of their older brothers. And here we have the younger instead of the older. It's a common theme in the Bible. God's probably going to do things in a way you did not expect. You get it all planned out. This is, I'm sure, what's going to happen. God will almost certainly do it a different way. But more important than just overturning these cultural expectations for the firstborn, it's a story about election. For all the years and centuries afterwards, the Israelites were meant to think, how did we get here? Remember, we didn't even have a business being born. That's one And let's remember, we had no business being first. We were chosen. And the story of twins puts this in the the starkest contrast. We know this today. Researchers all the time are trying to find twins. Maybe you know twins, or maybe some of you are twins, and they're always having to do, well, you want to do this study, because they can trace twins, and maybe growing up in different places, or maybe adopted by different families, and they can trace out, and it helps understand, well, what's nature, what's nurture, because you have so much of the same DNA, you're twins. Well, here, it's a spiritual test case. Jacob, not Esau. So what does that mean? The Israel was meant to think, why are we God's people? Why has God favored us as his chosen possession? It can't be It can't be a family thing because trace it all the way back. We have the same mother, Esau, Jacob, same mom. Maybe it's an ethnic thing. No, it can't be ethnicity because we're all Shemites, Semites. That's why Semitic is Jewish. Anti-Semitic is anti-Jew. It's from the word Shem. Well, maybe it's because something we've done. Uh Uh-uh, that's not going to work because they're in the womb before they had been born. Paul famously makes this point about Christians in Romans 9, though they were not yet born, had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. Now, I know the doctrine of election can be a hard doctrine for many people. It raises hard questions. You think about loved ones. You always have to remember, election is, is not some stop sign for people coming to God, and God says, sorry, no, I didn't choose you. No, it, it's actually hope that if whosoever God has ordained, they will come. And Jesus says, whoever comes to the Father, one, you can't come unless you're drawn, and, and two, if you come, you'll in no wise be cast out. So understand the doctrine of election raises deep issues for us. But we have to step back and see the larger point and, yes, rejoice in the point. Because if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, you have to think, why am I a Christian and not someone else? You all know people you love dearly who are not Christians. Some of them are your own 
physical relations. Some of them are people you've known for years and years. Some of you are friends you grew up with and you had the same kind of upbringing. Some of them, you were in the same churches together or same school and they don't believe and you do. Why? Really only two ultimate answers to that question. One is that somehow at the end of all that line, you say, well, they had bad parents or they made a mistake or somebody hurt them or some." Well, at the end of that, either you have to say, well, there's just a little teeny bit of a part of me that is a little bit more spiritual and smarter than they are, a little fraction. I don't want to take very much, but it's a, it's a, it's a little fraction, a, a dust mite of, of a particle of something in me that's a little bit better. Or you have to say, my origin story, before they had been born or done anything good or bad, God said, in order that his purpose of election might stand, the older shall serve the younger. Jacob, I have loved, Esau, I have hated. It's a hard word, but the alternative, friends, is even harder to think that some and unbiblical. No, your origin story, if you're a Christian, is God made you, he gave you life, he gave you new birth, he chose you. That's your story. That's how you got here. Yes, there's other parts of the story. There's parents involved. There's a book. There's a sermon. There's a pastor. There's a youth leader. There's a friend. There's a spouse. But ultimately, how you got here, if you're a Christian, because God remade you and he chose you. So you, you can't say it's ultimately because of your family. It wasn't because of Jacob's family. You certainly can't say it's your ethnicity as if that makes you farther or closer to God. You certainly can't say it's anything you did. It wasn't your works. It was God's call from all eternity. It wasn't your purpose that started the story. You did not start your story. It was God's story, which is good news because he who began a good work in you, we can be sure will be faithful to complete it. The world wants to always mold us, shape us into its image. And one of the ways it does that, it'd be nice if it just came to us with a, a catechism, here's what you should believe. If you don't believe you're Heidelberg, don't believe you're Westminster, believe this, but it doesn't. It comes to us much, much more subtly because the devil is an angel of masquerading as an angel of light. And one of the things the world wants to do is it, it gives you an alternative story of, of what made you who you are. And maybe it tells you that you're just the product of your DNA, can't, can't help any of that. Or you're, you're just the product of a culture in which you were raised. Or your origin story is just absolutely cemented by who your parents were, or by some great thing that happened or some terrible thing that happened. And none of us want to discount the role that biology plays, hereditary traits, environment, parents, all of these things, of course, do shape us. But what is your ultimate origin story? How did you get here? Why are you, on a Saturday night, singing songs to Jesus, listening to the Bible, wanting to hear a sermon to praise God? How did that happen? Where did you come from? The Bible tells us. God created you. God created you again. And before all of that, he chose you. Do not forget who you are. When pastors, preachers shy away from the doctrine of election, for example, thinking that they might be helping their people because it's just difficult or controversial or brings up hard metaphysical questions, they are, they are fancying themselves wiser than God because God tells us these things. And he tells us these things not to do this, I went through that phase when I was in college as well, and I could set them all up, and you know, then I would get the, the nice little college girl to say, "Well, if, uh, if 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 God chooses, then who am I? You know, then I I guess I can't be blamed." And then I take them to Romans nine. Who are you to talk back to God? <laughs> Sit down. God didn't give us these things 
so we can prove ourselves better theologians than others. But he did give us these things that we might be happier Christians, that we might understand who we really are, that we might understand that the grace that saves a, a wretch like me didn't begin yesterday, didn't begin the moment of your conversion. That grace, that grace was predetermined. You were chosen in him, in that grace, before there ever was a history, before there ever was a time. You were made through Christ. You were chosen in Christ. You're saved by Christ. That explains how we got here. It explains where we are going. It is for all of us in Jesus. And every true church, it is our origin story. Grace upon grace, all grace, and grace alone. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for your word. We pray that you would remind us of these things and what we have seen may we not unsee, that we may know who and what we are. In Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you for watching the 2023 Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology. Here we stand. Audio recordings of the conference, books from our speakers, as well as other excellent resources are available at AllianceLive.org.